You're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm your host, John Cook. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist. And I have two remarkable women with me here tonight uh, that are going to be telling us about their work on sudden cardiac death and specifically using imaging to stratify, stratify risk of sudden cardiac death. Let me tell you a little bit about these uh, professors from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Catherine Wu is a general cardiologist in the Heart and Vascular Institute at Johns Hopkins. She received her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania and completed her residency in cardiology fellowship at the Johns Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine and joined the faculty in 2000. Her research focuses on predictors of sudden cardiac death using magnetic resonance imaging and also uh, providing individualized risk prediction. She works closely with Dr. Natalia Trianova, uh, who is the Murray B. Sachs Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins, where she's also Professor of Medicine. The focus of her research is on computational cardiac electrophysiology and cardiology uh, using clinical imaging-based models of human hearts that represent the functioning of the heart, and using a personalized simulation approach, she's developed new methods for predicting cardiac arrest and improving the accuracy of atrial and ventricular catheter ablation therapies. She's published over 380 scientific papers. She's got an NIH uh, Director Pioneer Award and many other awards, including a fellow. Of the, she's a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. And uh, these two women work very closely together uh, to really enhance our understanding of the risk, stratifying the risk of. Uh, sudden cardiac death using imaging. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, my, it's our, our pleasure. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. But first, I thought I'd, I'd ask you a few questions. For number one, um, Dr. Wu is a cardiologist, and uh, Dr. Trianova is in biomedical engineering. How did you guys get together and start to work together? Yeah, so I actually had a long-standing interest in um, post-infarction um, arrhythmias and sudden death um, and uh, uh, was lucky to be involved in the early ages of uh, cardiac MRI for, for its use in tissue characterization and, and uh, quantifying infarct size. And so from that, um, uh, we, I was um, embarked on uh, research in clinical risk prediction risk prediction and personalization of patients at risk for sudden cardiac death post-MI. And um, at the time, um, in, in um, the mid-early uh, 2000s, I think that Natalia came over uh, from, uh, from Tulane and was recruited to, for BME. And um, knowing some of her computational work um, at the time um, in, in silico, uh, we formed a, a collaboration at that time uh, trying to meld um, multi-dimensional imaging uh, with her computational prowess to uh, try to really personalize and kind of um, to to, um, to develop a um, a uh, in silico and in, in vivo um, EP study, which we'll talk about uh, later. So that um, that was kind of how we started. Um, it was quite a, quite a while ago already, and about 2009. Mm -hmm. You mentioned tissue characterization, Dr. Wu. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, just briefly? What what is your interest in tissue characterization? Looking at scar or um so late gadolinium enhancement has is, is really pioneered uh, tissue characterization, and um, with gadolinium, you can quantify and delineate uh, the extent of the infarct, and uh, we built on that and to characterize um, differences in the heterogeneity in the scar based on signal intensity differences. Uh, so we uh, described um, the gray zone, which is an area that subtends the very dense uh, core infarct, and it's these regions of uh, heterogeneity gray zone surrounding in the core that actually uh, provide the substrate for the reentrant circuits uh, required for the pathophysiologic um, substrate of sudden death. Um, so it's um, that part that um, really goes beyond just infarct size alone, but um, describing characteristics of the scar that are most associated with um, arrhythmia. And just one, one last question about that. Are there, is there anything that we can do about the, the, those zones in terms of uh, causing regeneration or, or reversing the ischemia or is there, what can we do to alter that situation? All right, so that's uh, still an area of an investigation and, um, and um, stem cells, for instance, whether or not um, it in some way may, and there's some question about whether stem cell therapy for infarcts, for instance, 
could um, precipitate or um, or um, generate more of those gray zone areas, but it's actually probably more complex than that from a lot of the machine learning and, and um, artificial intelligence approaches that we're looking at. Um, it's probably a complex interplay of both the size and the uh, characteristics and the shapes of these, so more than just um, whether it's present or not, but how we kind of Im impact that and reduce, or um, it's mostly probably reducing the total infarct size and the total core, um, the densely infarcted region that might be most important. Interesting. If we have more time, uh, maybe we can get back to that, but I want to give Dr. Trinova a chance to, to talk about uh, how you guys started to work together and what drew you to uh, Johns Hopkins and cardiology. Um, so I moved to Hopkins back in 2006. I was, as Kathy mentioned, I was previously at Tulane University and, um, you know, I, I had a number of offers at that time and I was trying to decide where to go and the biggest deciding factor was clinical faculty that are willing to collaborate with me mm -hmm. because I was working more in on the sort of a basic science aspect of arrhythmia mechanisms where you use computational modeling and sort of you are able to dissect mechanisms but based on experimental data and figure out what exactly is happening. And I thought that our technology has gotten to the point where we can use, you know, the incorporate imaging within our um, tools and being able to actually represent what's happening in a personalized heart. And that was really a big endeavor. So when I first moved to Hopkins, um, this was the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get um, in touch and, and work with people who are, um, who work in imaging and also in are, you know, related to cardiac electrophysiology. So all that, that clinical aspects can be melded with our tools and our, our mm -hmm. understanding of the sort of a deeper mechanism of, of arrhythmogenesis and form an approach that is unique to us. And that's what has happened actually, we became sort of um, a niche um, sort of collaborative group where, um, you know, we, we were the first to generate a model, personalized model of the human heart. And that doesn't happen just with, you know, with the knowledge that we had, you need imaging, you need a lot of, you know, validation with electrophysiology, all that. And so, Hopkins for me has been incredible in terms of the collaborations mm -hmm. and Kathy, Dr. Wu was the first one with whom I started. Mm -hmm. I remember, I will never forget that. She was the first clinical faculty who actually came to my office in engineering, you know? <laughs> so, and, and then we sat down and we talked and ever since we have collaborated. Well, congratulations okay. to both of you for crossing that chasm because that is hard, right? We're all so busy yeah. and to reach across that divide uh, and uh, start a collaboration is uh, with, with two very different fields is what makes in beautiful things happen. Such interesting things happen at those interfaces, right? Well, exactly. um, I, uh, we're about to get started on the program and um, uh, Dr. Trinova is going to show some slides and we're going to talk through them. Um, and I, I'll probably have some questions and Dr. Wu will certainly have some additional comments on those slides as we go along. And I'd like to invite the uh, audience also to ask questions and make comments. And what you can do is you can join us by web or you can join us by text. And the way to join by the web is to go to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, and then respond to the activity. Or you can join by text text to Bakey to 37607, so you text, you text 37607 and write in to Bakey, text your message, and uh, we'll get that question. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started, and uh, Dr. Trinova is going to share her slides with us, and uh, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, go through those slides, and uh, Dr. Wu will be commenting on them as well. Okay, do you see the slide presentation? Looks yeah. good. Okay. Um, so I have entitled this Predicting Cardio uh, Risk of Sudden Cardiac Death Applications of Digital Twin Technology and Machine Learning. Um, I, you know, digital twin technology, we refer to this as a basically, in this case, um, this 
digital twin technology is applied to the heart. Typically, it's an old concept. It's been used in industry um, to optimize operation and maintenance of physical assets. But what it represents is basically the um, both the elements of an entity as well as the dynamics of the components. And, um, you know, I have looked at the literature and there is a lot of talk about the concept of the digital twin um, being one of the potential big disruptors in healthcare um, because it would enable building of these continuously adjustable personalized models of patients or their organs, in this case the heart, based on track data. And everything starts with imaging ultimately because it gives us sort of understanding of the shape of the heart, which is, you know, that's where all the relationships between the different elements of the, the digital heart um, are contained. So that's why for us imaging and, and this collab collaboration has been um, so important. Um, also, and one of the biggest benefits of the digital twin um, uh, twins is that, and that may not necessarily show up now in predicting risk of sudden cardiac death, but we use all that for, let's say, predicting where to ablate in patients. And when you're doing that, um, you can, you can predict what's the response of the patient to the therapy. That's actually very important because then you can tailor the um, therapy in response in anticipation of the patient's response. So that's sort of an overview of this technology that, that you're using. We are actually fusing it, um, as you will see, with artificial intelligence, and that will be a very important component. But okay. here is how we started collaborating with Dr. Wu. Um, so basically as she has been pioneering imaging and particularly um, contrast enhanced um, LG MRI in outlining what are um, the components of the infarct and their contribution particularly the gray zone their, its contribution to arrhythmogenesis and what we thought that we can use that imaging data we can construct a digital representation of the patient heart with her data, with her imaging data, and then we populate this digital um, heart with cells that communicate with each other and interact and have different properties in the different um, remodeled zones of the heart. And then we can assess arrhythmia propensity in this digital substrate. And assessing arrhythmia propensity is basically one of, because risk of sudden cardiac death is predominantly for, from arrhythmogenesis. So we are trying to assess how um, likely it is that arrhythmia will occur in this digital patient's heart, and then we are able to stratify a risk. And let me ask um, a that. let me ask a question there to, to Dr. Wu, um, uh, because uh, she's the cardiologist that understands what's going on in these gray zones. What what is it exactly that's predisposing to arrhythmia in the gray zones? Can you describe the biology of that? The electrophysiology of what's going on that, that causes uh, uh, these arrhythmias? So it's basically just uh, having a different um, um, uh, regions. The core zone is just the very densely infarcted region that's kind of the center of the, of the infarct. Um, and then having these um, in, uh, interleaved um, uh, normal with uh, core digitation around the um, periphery of the scar is what creates the, the uh, electrical inhomogeneity um, that um, that uh, promotes and uh, uh, perpetuates um, re-entering arrhythmias. So we've shown that in a number of, um, of um, uh, so there's been some um, animal models from my colleagues um, at Hopkins to Henry Halpern and, and Hiroshi Ashikaga that showed it nicely in a um, in a in, in vivo um, porcine model of infarct under high resolution MRI. You can see these really complex interdigitations of uh, of uh, scar patterns mm. where you have a, again this very kind of densely homogeneously scarred region um, with these. Um, kind of bundles of surviving myocytes, which it, that in, admixture mm. causes this intermediate signal intensity on MRI that we've described. So we've, so in those regions where there's a, this admixture that also create channels um, through which these arrhythmic re reentrant circuits um, can propagate, 
um, can be de described in, in a general way on MRI, but just looking at differences in signal intensity. And so in the in vivo porcine model, um, uh, Henry Halperin and um, Hiroshi showed that these regions by MRI corresponded um, to inducible reentrant arrhythmic circuits um, using SOC electrodes, a very um, uh, detailed um, um, uh, electrophysiology studies. And um, so we extended that in the patient population to describe in general these, um, these uh, re regions of gray zone that um, correspond to, to uh, increased risk um, in patient cohorts. So in a, a large number of um, many different studies, over like 2,000 um, in a meta-analysis um, show that uh, gray zone regions, larger gray zone regions are associated with higher risk. So that's, that's and interesting. And just to add to that, if I, if I may, also um, because of what Dr. Wood described, this interdigitation of sort of a viable and non-viable myocardium, if you look at the bulk electrophysiological property in this gray zone, it ends up being slower conduction velocity. Mm -hmm. When you have a slower conduction velocity of propagation, it slows the activation and it's one of the sort of a, a conditions that um, allows re-entry to set up. Mm -hmm. Another um, characteristic of the gray zone that has been reported to the uh, cellular level is extension of action potential duration. And that also can, because you have heterogeneity between normal zone and, and gray zone, when the activation comes, it blocks there, plus it propagates lower. And all these other heterogeneities the doctor would describe. So it is this area of remodeled both structural and electrophysiological properties. Now, you guys, uh, you've referred to this as, as being occurring at the uh, site of a uh, myocardial infarction, but is, can this happen uh, in the absence of a myocardial infarction? Can you have these gray zones occur for other reasons in the heart than uh, trigger arrhythmias? So we've also seen it in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. So you similarly can get these uh, patterns when you have these dense uh, regions of fibrosis as well as uh, these less um, um, infarcted uh, or less scarred regions also. So it, it extends beyond just um, ischemic injury. Beautiful. Thanks. Oh, also in atrial fibrillation for patients who have fibrosis, fibrotic remodeling, the mechanisms are very similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and yes, I wanted please. to show you, or is that, would you, or yeah. would you, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. So this is our uh, first paper with Dr. Wu, um, where we predicted risk of sudden cardiac death due to arrhythmia our first attempt was in ischemic cardiomyopathy. It's Dr. Wu's imaging data. Um, we, so it is a computational approach that takes the images, you build these models of the patients, and then predict which of these patients are going to have, or the, the substrate has propensity to arrhythmia. We call the approach VARP, Virtual, arrhythmia, virtual Heart Arrhythmia Risk Predictor. Um, so I just wanted to show you how we build these models. And basically, um, you can see here one of Dr. Wu's images. Um, we basically, like I said, just a crude description of the segmentation. And then you can see we have an infarct. And you can see here, um, you know, we reconstruct the three-dimensional geometry. And you have the core infarct that Dr. Wu was referring to in yellow. And then here we have a gray zone showing shown in um, in blue so this in terms of signal intensity as dr Wu said those are areas of intermediate signal intensity and then we create electro again this is scaffolding for us it is the the patient ge heart geometry and then we populate with different types of cells depending on whether they are remodeled or not in these different regions and then we would pace the heart give it a little bit of a signal and see whether arrhythmia will ensue because the propagation will find its way through this complex structure and potentially um, re-enter. So here is, we did 41 patients um, and you can see here, and I'll run the video again. Um, so again, they are Dr. Wu's cohort and the reason, there were many more patients. However, for us, the quality of the imaging of, you know, clinical scans are not always necessarily uh, of the highest quality. 
we've gotten better at using clinical scans. This was our first attempt, so we needed a fairly high quality of the, of the image so we can resolve all the gray zone and the scar. These patients all were, had, and Dr. Wu can give you a lot more detail, of, this is her cohort, but the important thing is that they had ICDs implanted and they were followed up for a number of years, but we were blind to this clinical outcome. What we, what we were provided only was the images. So the entire digital heart here is built, this digital twin of the heart is built on the imaging, the understanding that when, when you have different intensity on the images, you have electrophysiological heterogeneity associated with that. And, uh, to, so what this slide... To uh -huh. Dr. Yes, I was just ahead. a question to Dr. Wu then. Um, when um, you, ha you have these images, uh, you, are you assigning some electrophysiological property then, um, some conductivity? I am. Oh, so, I am. so, yes, so yeah. you're assigning some uh, electrophysiological yes. property to the gray exactly. zone, for example. Yes. I see yes. more than, I see multiple colors though, so you must have multiple electrophysiological substrates. Yeah, there. well, you can see at the bottom. So what this slide represents is of these 41 patients, we have 32 shown here. That's how much I could fit in the slide. So, uh, and in the movie. And so what you can see here, all of these patients received ICDs. So they, they had uh, devices implanted. Uh, they were considered high risk. They had uh, ejection fra fra uh, fraction less than 35 percent. But we demonstrated that of these 32 shown here, 10 were non-inducible for arrhythmias. And what you see here is actually the scar and gray zone distribution. Gray zone is here um, shown in green and the core scar is in yellow. And the other 22 were inducible, meaning we gave them a stimulus and you were able to generate um, a recirculating wave, a re-entry. Uh, so let me play this again. Sorry. Okay, so in these, in these 22 patients, they were in, basically we gave a stimulus and they were inducible. Arrhythmia could be induced. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that they were all considered clinically at high risk, we demonstrated that we are able to better stratify the patients. And um, this is basically the performance of this risk predictor. And you can see here, um, basically this is uh, data from Dr. Wu as well, ejection fraction, of course and volume, scar volume, LD mass, other parameters that have been used. And in this case, you know, again, this is a proof, proof of concept study. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that we actually, uh, this was the best predictor in this case. Um, we also had another study that had a few more patients that were, uh, had ejection fraction that was 35, above 35%. And so there is no like limitation to our approach in terms of whether they're below or above 35%. Um, so we are able to suggest with this approach that a patient who might have 40 or 40 something percent of ejection fraction might need to receive uh, primary prevention, although under the current clinical criteria, they may not be. So it is demonstrating that, um, you know, by, assessing the arrhythmogenic propensity of the substrate, we are actually able to, uh, you know, predict who will develop wow. risk of center. That's cardiac. very useful. So the, the primary outcome here, I, I gather, was, um, was whether or not the patient required uh, to be uh, defibrillated, cardioverted. Is that, is that correct? The pa that was the primary? It was, it was appropriate firing uh, for um, ventricular arrhythmia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was the primary outcome, and, and your 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 uh, VAR performance was it was uh, highly predictive of who would require that. It was. That. It was. I mean, this is sort of understandable in a way be, because I I believe it is because it, what we are doing here is we are really representing the main. There are other factor potentially that would help would contribute, but this is the main sort of mechanistic factor. This is a really deeply mechanistic model. It is representing all the changes at the ionic level, conduction velocity, 
all the, you know, the complex geometry of the gray zone, the distribution of the gray zone and scar, all that together, in a way, it's a very nonlinear system, you're putting everything together, you stimulate it, and then you let go and see what's happening. And that's, um, that's what we demonstrated. It was really predictive in this case. Beautiful. So it's a very highly um, representative of the trigger and the substrate, and both are required for, for sudden cardiac death. Um, so that's that's really, I think, the uh, advantage of this approach and, and the fact um, that um, it really mimics an electrophysiology study. Uh, so an invasive um, um, electrophysiology study, uh, but in here, it, well, Natalia also um, extended it to actually uh, stimulate many more sites um, and to, uh, f for induction of inducibility than what's done in, in the um, in the clinical EP study. Um, so there's a, a number of advantages to that. And so this non-invasive method um, really has kind of potential um, as a, a patient's heart changes over time to, to also reassess their irritability. So, so it's that combination of trigger and substrate that's um, critically important for sudden death. So you're stimulating, I mean, when you say you're stimulating, this is a, a simulated stimulation of a portion yes, of the heart to see case, if there's yes, a... Yes, yeah, yes, that's, yes. That's, yeah, that's, we just give pacing stimuli at a number of locations. Uh -huh. Actually, we can give them whatever we want. We can go anywhere in the LV. We can test that mm -hmm. and see whether it's inducible because that's exactly what Dr. Wu is saying. You know, if you want to do a... Um, electrophysiological study on the patient, it is not possible to access yeah. uh, locations like what we're doing. In the You're going to put the electrophysiologists yeah. out of business. Um, the, not just happening. kidding. No, <laughs> we are there to help. We are there to help. Um, so, Catherine, um, how would you uh, use this information in your patients? So, so we have to validate this, Nillard. This was a proof of concept, um, and so, but there actually is an ongoing study um, um, in in general um, looking at. There's a resurgence in interest actually in um, in, uh, in using inducibility. So what what uh, would be um, warranted? Um, so Natalia has actually extended this into VT ablation to to um, to um, identify uh, location of ablation sites. And uh, what we'd be interested in doing uh, down the road is also trying to validate this in larger cohorts to be able to re replace um, an electrophysiology study uh, to um, and improve prediction. So EP site has kind of gone by the wayside, but um, in, in the old trials, it is a strong uh, predictor of, uh, of um, um, appropriate firing. Um, so I think it, um, and, and, as I, and as I mentioned, there is an ongoing trial actually trying to re, uh, resurgence in the invasive EP study, looking at it immediately post MI. Um, so I think there's a re a recrudescence and a reinterest in, in looking at this combined trigger and substrate, um, but um, it has to be validated in larger numbers of patients. Great. Okay, let's keep going. This is interesting. Yeah, so um, we try to involve the right ventricle as well, right? Uh, here, although we simulated the entire heart, but the infarct was most was predominantly the left ventricle. So we tried to do um, to sort of predict what um, whether they will have whether patients with repaired tetralogy of Fallot might have. Um, we might be able to use a similar approach. We, we couldn't collect a lot of data. It was really difficult and it's particularly difficult to have and you know a good imaging on tetralogy of flow in the right ventricles but um it so um we were given seven images we were provided actually from two hospitals um seven patients with a repaired tetralogy of flow they actually it was an interesting study because they were all considered clinically low risk for vt based on QRS duration. Um, but, you know, so they were assessed to all be low risk, but actually two of them ended up with um, clinical VT. But we didn't know that. So we were just given the images again and the blind inducibility study. And we were actually able to show that we got arrhythmia in these two patients. Actually, these are the images from these patients. This is the arrhythmia. Um, like sort of this is an activation map you can see going through sort of through the areas of fibrosis in the right ventricle and re-entering um for us it was even smaller concept of proof of concept cohort but um again we are really dependent on the quality of the images but it demonstrates that you know it's not limited to the to the left ventricle um 
we, you know, we could do um, right ventricular studies as well. We are now working, actually, now we are putting a lot of effort in extending that to um, ARVC patients. And by now, in the last month, we've done 30 of those, but I don't have, I'm not yet ready to show results for those, but we will get back to the right ventricle. But I wanted to show you something, another application, and I, um, yes, so what, as you can see here, we are using the imaging, mostly to create, the imaging to create um, these digital hearts, but there are other clinical data that we are not taking into account. You know, you might have, um, you, you may want to incorporate other comorbidities or they can covariates. Of, there is a variety of clinical data that might also want to be incorporated so there will be a more accurate prediction of sudden cardiac uh, death risk. And so we decided that it would be really beneficial to combine computational modeling with artificial intelligence, where the artificial intelligence is used to bring in, in the approach, data that is not part of the model. Okay, and Natalia, hold we, that thought for just a moment. That That is uh -huh. really interesting. But we just had a question pop up that I think is yes. relevant to what you, you were just speaking about. The question from the audience is, uh, actually two questions. One is, besides pacing the model by accelerating it, do you s also s s simulate its deceleration? Um, so pacing, so in an in a electrophysiological study, you elicit activation with a protocol, um, a rapid pacing protocol. You pace at a certain cycle length, then, de then you decrease the pacing cycle length and watch whether re-entry occurs. If not, you decrease the pacing length and so forth until re-entry is induced. So if it is induced, and we follow the clinical protocol exactly. If re-entry is induced, it's induced, and then the substrate is prone to arrhythmia, period. So we check the patient as uh, this would be, um, we stratified as potentially having an arrhythmia. Uh, we don't decelerate because we don't pace anymore. Once the arrhythmia is induced, that's that. So it's just, uh, sort of a, a rapid pacing with decremental coupling interval. It's exactly how it's done in the clinic. Okay. When the patient is paced. Um, Looks yeah. like Kathy has something to add to that. No, but this <laughs> next question might be for you, Kathy. Um, uh, would it be useful to f further characterize electrophysiological properties of the gray zone to mimic other properties of the e EP properties of the gray zone? In other words, I guess I think the question is that uh, can you split the gray zone uh, more finely? Is there uh, uh, different forms of gray zone? Uh, yes, we're, we're limited in, in, from imaging and clinical imaging uh, just because you're, you're up your uh, voxel size. So um, that's kind of one limitation there to further kind of characterize or split hairs. So um, that's kind of a limitation that um, we haven't kind of deep diving deeper into kind of the, um, the um, what you can represent on clinical imaging. But as imaging improves, um, and perhaps also by um, using um, artificial intelligence or so, so radiomics, looking at texture analysis, looking at uh, different um, properties of the um, of the what you can get in the imaging, you may be able to kind of drill down further. Um, we're also interested in looking kind of like at three dimensional relationships. Um, um, so across slices um, to kind of better define which gray zones are um, more associated um, with higher risk. Okay. So I think part of part of that it depends on on what your outcome is. So I think you need more precision, for instance, when you're trying to do something like VT ablation and isolating the site for the ablation. If you're generally looking at risk, um, risk stratification for um, for patients, you may just need in general like a that a larger region has an increased propensity in the right trigger um, to lead to an arrhythmia. So I think it, it also depends on what your, your, um, your endpoint is and, and, um, and the, uh, the goal. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, I wanted to show you our study on patients with cardiac sarcoid and as, and 
Kathy can, um, you know, give you more information, but basically patients with cardiac sarcoid, um, typically they have two important aspects of remodeling. They have inflammation and they have fibrosis. They have a distribution of fibrosis throughout the, the ventricles often. And for us, we have worked until here, as you can see with LGMRI uh, mostly, we wanted to combine this information uh, from PET as well in our models to see whether we incorporate um, the inflammation part of the story in the, in the model. Um, so we, this is our latest paper, um, and so we created these digital twin hearts of patients with cardiac sarcoid where here we are using multimodality imaging and personalized modeling, but also everything then comes into a machine learning multivariate classifier because we are also taking the um, clinical data as well in. Uh, so we did here uh, 45 patients and they had both um, CMRLG scans and PET scans. And of those 45, 16 had VT, of course, we didn't know that. It's again blind to the, um, to the outcome, to the clinical outcome. So what we endeavored here to do is to create this fusion model of LG and PET fusion model. And you know, we co-registered, created, and so the, the model, and then we have sort of a non-disease part, part of where we have inflammation, fibrosis and inflammation overlapping and fibrosis only. And so here is how a model like that would look like there. It's very heterogeneous. There are a lot of areas. Now they end up therefore having different electrophysiological properties. We know what's happening in fibrosis. We know what inflammation does. Inflammation decreases conduction velocity. And then we have areas of overlap. There is also change in anisotropy ratios in the propagation. So all that is incorporated in a model like that. And because this was brand new, um, never been used before, um, you know, kind of combining these imaging modalities, we had to validate it with the clinical data. And so um, we basically uh, predicted where to ablate patients in, in patients with, they were undergoing uh, ablation for VT and we predicted where these ablation targets would be and then compared it where the clinical ablations were executed. And you can see, for instance, here is one re-entered circuit and here um, was the ablation and our prediction exactly um, coincides. This is another one showing here. This is another patient. Um, some areas the ablation was of course much bigger because <clears throat> that was a substrate ablation so the areas are larger but we were able to validate we had very good results with the model and so this is now only one part of our approach what we are doing next so this is we are using pet mri and knowledge of electrophysiology to create a model of the patient and predict where the arrhythmia arises and then we take the results of the computer model it's this is a multi-dimensional data um, per, per pa patient heart, we, we had a number of locations from which we paced, I think about 10. So we had um, over 560 runs of the models for these patients. So all that output of the data of the simulations is combined with clinical data and also with imaging data. And so you may ask, well, why are you putting again imaging data in your predictor? The reason is um, what Kathy mentioned, there is also texture in the images. When you create a model, you threshold the model. You say, this is a gray zone, this is a coarse car. So I'm thresholding the data to create um, the digital heart model. But I am aware that there may be additional information in the images. So then we use the images as one of the inputs in this um, random forest feature selection algorithm together with the clinical data. And then the algorithm selects the most important features and then we, we basically 
um, use a, um, a predictor, we call it CHI, which is from computational heart and artificial intelligence to predict risk of sudden cardiac death of all that data together. And so I want to show you the outcome of this. And you can see here, again, this is only 45 patients. And you can see here, um, again, of quite good values for the area under the receiver operating uh, curve on cross-validation and testing. Also, what is important is we really, one of the hyperparameters was balancing sensitivity and specificity. We wanted to do that because if you look at the clinical test, the current risk prediction method clinically, you can see like left ventricular ejection fraction has a very low sensitivity. Fibrosis on MRI has lower specificity, the same for, for PET. So we wanted to create a balanced sensitivity and specificity and also have predictive capability. So that's the outcome of this, um, of this, of, of this approach where we have both artificial intelligence, so starts with imaging, multimodality imaging, computational modeling, artificial intelligence, and you have a risk predictor. What's important here is, and I wanna sort of for a second digress on that. People always say, oh, do you have enough data to do, uh, to do artificial intelligence? Well, not always we may have huge amounts of data. Um, but here we demonstrate that the computational modeling is a source of data in a way because it's really mechanistic and reflects how electrical, how arrhythmias originate in this interaction between a trigger and a substrate. And all that is part of the, the, the simulations. So the simulations serve two purposes here. They provide mechanistic underpinning and explainability in a artificial intelligence approach. And second, they provide a huge amount of data that is combined with the imaging and clinical data and is all the algorithm learns on all of that. And that's why we were able to get such, I think really good results on a, a cohort of 45 patients. I got uh, a couple of questions relevant to what you just said that popped up. Um, does uh, the personalized model take into account antiarrhythmic drug effects? I think you answered that, but but uh, specifically, what about antiarrhythmic drugs? You can do that because we. So this is a this is a what we call a biophysically detailed model. It has ion channels in it, and so you can do that. You can say, okay, the patient has on whatever drug. How does it affect the channels? I can change the channel kinetic, and I can do that. Actually, we've done that in some of the patients where we predict where to ablate because there you have to be here. It's like, would they have general arrhythmogenesis? Um, as Dr. Wu was explaining before, um, in some cases we need uh, more precise assessment and then we would take into account um, mm -hmm. you know, the drugs, but it's possible. Now, having said all that, these computational models where you do the simulations, they are really computationally heavy because you have from single cell or ionic channels to the whole heart. And so our goal here would be to decrease the computational load by sort of mixing artificial intelligence within the simulation. So you don't have to run the cycle all the time. You can do much faster. Um, so that's one, one way we are going. But then we want to also have a broader incorporation of um, clinical variables, for instance, ECGs. We are working now in incorporating time series in these predictors and, and so forth. And I have here a slide that I created about other uses of um, AI in risk prediction. Um, like one of the papers is actually Dr. Wu's um, um, here and um, uh, this one, um, people have done a sort of texture analysis. Um, they have tried to do just electronic health records for prediction of sudden cardiac death. Um, there, there is an approach in which monophasic action potentials, which is like the action potential where they were uh, invasive recordings and based on these recordings, there was an attempt to, from the shape of the action potential to predict which patients are 
more susceptible to developing conarrhythmias. These are all approaches that majority of them, the basis of them is imaging and with other combinations. And we are also learning on a new approach in which we want to do a deep learning on the CMR images and as well as covariate da data. And this is a new project um, that we are working with Dr. Wu. Um, actually, it's sort of completed and now the paper is, is under review. But hopefully, you know, if we present again, that would be part of what we want to talk about. Um, but one thing I wanted to emphasize here is, again, imaging is so important and processing the images is really difficult, particularly LG MRI data. It, um, Dr. Wu's group had previously segmented um, a lot of the images that we have used, um, but we have, together with her, we have recently developed a deep learning approach to segment LG MRI, CMR images. Um, it takes 30 seconds to do an image. And um, one of my uh, students worked with her to develop it. And then we, we had a, the ground truth uh, segmentation was Dr. Wu's data. And um, so we were able to predict LV and scar segmentation, and we achieved 96 and 75% uh, respectively balanced accuracy. And the difference between the total scar, between the manual and the artificial intelligence predicted segmentations was, was uh, 2%. But about the most important part of this approach was that the artificial, the deep learning network here is um, and sort of we call it anatomically informed, which means is it keeps the shape of the left ventricle because artificial intelligence has been, learning has been done on slices and on each slice they might have an excellent concordance with the ground truth, but when the slices are looked as going from, let's say, from apex to base, they are completely dis displaced. There are no approaches that keep the shape, shape that there are anatomical constraints within the deep learning approach. So um, in, in collaboration with Dr. Wu, we developed that. And I just wanted to show you, I think here, this is pretty much the end of these slides, is like um, a f couple patients. Um, so this is the ground truth segmentation and the predicted segmentation, and you can see um, it's pretty good for 30 seconds or per image. So um, we actually adopted this approach for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and actually currently it's being used for uh, patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Can I ask you a question Anyways. right there about that, about that slide? The, the ground truth segmentation now, is that, is, uh, is that a, a, a segmentation that's done manually by an operator like Dr. Wu? By Dr. Wu's team, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and so then you're comparing the, um, the manual uh, calculation of the SCAR area to the predicted by algorithm. And yeah, by the, by the deep learning network, yes. The deep learning network. And the deep learning network, you said something about it's just a 30, second, 30 seconds 30 of seconds imaging? 30 seconds per image to do that. I see. Okay. And you can get the results. Wonderful. And it's a full LV shape. You have all the slices and they are lined. Okay. So it's not like sticking left and right. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, so to, it, as you can see, it is a complete marriage of um, imaging and tool developments. And we believe in this marriage where the, the computer, Imaging is always part of clinical practice, but we all hope that the computational modeling and the artificial intelligence will also become major tools, and, and it will be made in such a way that it really is usable at um, you know at the point of, of care, um, not just uh, a study that demonstrates that the, um, that the tools work. But bringing these tools to the point of care, and this is a very sort of an important point to me in what we are developing, really requires institutional commitment and engagement of all stakeholders. It, you know, you need to have a platform in the hospital where these tools are um, deployed and, um, you know, software engineers that can hook some of these algorithms to 
electronic health records and you know this will make everything flow seamlessly but we are kind of far from that and i think this is really an important point oh you've, you've, you've come a long way it's a happened. it's a beautiful collaboration and uh, i just uh, really think you guys are onto something very unique i didn't realize it had advanced this far um, the um i have um a couple of questions from the, from the audience that going back to the uh, personalized model uh, one of the questions was uh, did you observe differences in response to antiarrhythmic drugs in in the model we didn't specifically test antiarrhythmic drugs the um we didn't do response to drugs it was just whether the patient with its structural and electrophysiological remodeling are they susceptible to arrhythmias that's the question that we answered they might have been on drugs um, but we didn't test effects of drugs and a question to dr wu um is do you is this modifying your therapy at all of your patients are you using you know this these imaging um, advanced imaging approaches to treat your patients differently uh, for sure imaging definitely for for a sort of tiebreaker um, um, you know s situations it hasn't made it to the guidelines yet so you know there no the, the difficulty is there's no accepted thresholds yet um, to act on but yeah personally yes if someone doesn't if someone doesn't have scar I'm pretty low likely or very low amounts of scar and gray zone it's it's, it's a low likelihood for me per, um, particularly in this day and age of uh, of um, automatically recommending um, ICDs, it's always a shared decision-making uh, process with the patient. So I think it's a it's an additional um, it's an additional um, factor um, that um, it's it definitely uh, factors into other um, other um, um, disease, not just ischemic cardiomyopathy, but in, even in HCM. So imaging already has made a bit of impact on how we. Um, consider and risk stratify patients. So um, definitely um, the amount and uh, the composition of scar does make a difference clinically. Just to follow up on that, if in, in a patient uh, post MI uh, has got scar, is there some amount of thresh, is there some threshold of scar that would make you more or less likely to advocate greater intervention like an ICD? Do you, do you have some sort of threshold there? So we, we have it from our studies. Um, um, generally, it's um, about five to ten grams of gray zone. So I'll, I'll tell you about um, a, um, a a large study that I actually am involved in, which is called Profit. It's it's out of uh, Europe. So it's um, it's a um, multinational study. Um, it's involving um, first retrospective data, including ours from Hopkins and the and the major made it um, trials and ICD trials. So it first involves this retrospective data to develop a clinical tool, uh, risk-based calculator from which there will be two actually randomized controlled trials, um, each about 2,000 patients, one in the low ejection fraction patients, where um, those with um, history of MI, low ejection fraction, currently meeting criteria for ICDs, um, those identified by the risk calculator as low risk will be randomized to either optimal, optimal medical therapy or ICD. ICD. And then there's this, uh, uh, the study's called PROFIT, and PROFIT preserved is at high ejection fraction, above 35% post-MI. Those identified as um, uh, high risk, uh, but currently don't meet criteria for ICD, will be randomized to OMT, um, to optical medical therapy and ICD. So I'll tell you, so based on our um, the initial, uh, uh, initial analysis and the machine, so they're also doing a number of machine learning methods. It's 85 variables from 200 thousand patients so what was interesting and um, the initial results of this of this study were um, presented at the European um, Society of Cardiology in September so the area under the curve for LV ejection fraction alone was 0 0.60 so which is relatively um, uh, good and no other clinical risk factor outside of imaging um, added to that prediction Wow. Um, so now um, underway is looking at all the MRI variables actually um, from the, so I think we will actually make headway and um, validate some of the um, some of these uh, thresholds that we've reported um, and it's I think it will make a big impact because um, there basically is no other clinical variable um, um, beyond um, to improve the risk prediction from EF um, so then there's prelim data shows that the MRI is going to probably be very impactful. 
I have a question, I think, from one of our electrophysiologists. As an alternative to ablation, is it feasible to test computationally focal pacing near the gray zone uh, in the right time in order to see, pace it correctly and reduce the electrical heterogeneity? I, I think it's pacing versus ablation. Can, can you, can you uh, test the, the, the uh, approach computationally? I mean, when uh, I let me understand the question right, is this an anti tachycardia pacing? I think that's what, that yeah, it's, it's an alternative to ablation. Yeah, ATP. So um, it is, yes, yeah, so it, it has to be, so it has to be, has to be a device that senses whether the patient is developing an arrhythmia and delivers the pulse, the, the ATP uh, treatment. Um, just pacing you know, without mo just a patient is, you know, about to have ablation and instead of having an ablation, could we pace it in the model to not have an ablation? That, no, that's not possible. Um, you know, anti-tachycardia pacing is a therapy that delivers pacing, but not shock, but it's through a similar device or the same device, as a matter of fact, as a defibrillator. Um, but otherwise, no, there would be no no, you will induce an arrhythmia in the model, for sure, mm -hmm. if you pace close to the gray zone, for sure. And then, apart from the absolute size of the scar, um, has its depth uh, toward the epicardium been tested as one of the variables in your model? So, I guess this is endocardial versus full thickness scar. I mean, for... For us, is whatever imaging we are provided, you, that's you, the patient-specific model, and you test the, that patient whether they will have an arrhythmia. I'm sure Dr. Wu has a lot of um, sort of patient experience looking at the transmurality of the infarct and which is more arrhythmogenic, and I'm sure she can comment. Specific location doesn't seem to, to matter, the endocardial versus epicardial. I think it, it is um, kind of the spatial distribution. I mean, we, we show there's spatial complexity um, uh, to yeah. it. So I think there are shape features. Um, I, I don't think they're readily described as only endocardial, only epicardial. I think it's, it's a lot of it. It's going to be the distribution and its relationship, um, spatial relationship um, three-dimensionally. So I think that's why it's, um, it's, it's a, I think it's a, it's a very complex relationship. So I don't think it's, um, it's, um, um, but certainly, um, you know, with modeling methods, you, you, uh, I think Natalia's looked at different sizes and there's a, it is a, um, it is a kind of a, um, there's a minimum threshold that needs to be, um, to be uh, reached to generate these reentrant um, arrhythmias. Right, well, but two patients who have the same amount, one may have an arrhythmia, the other not, because exactly as Dr. Wu is saying, distribution is very, very important, the complexity. Mm -hmm. How, you know, what is the distribution? What is the texture? What is the spatial complexity of that, um, of that remodeling? Wonderful. Well, I'm afraid uh, we're past the hour and we're going to have to draw it to a conclusion. But what a wonderful collaboration. Uh, what a wonderful work you're doing. I think the future is bright for computational modeling of the MR imaging and prediction. Uh, so thank you for your work and I look forward to seeing more. Um, you joined us tonight at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences and my guests were Dr. Catherine Wu and Dr. Natalia Trianova uh, at Johns Hopkins. School of Medicine, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for our speakers. Thank you, Goody, and thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye. Good night. Good night.